Yes, welcome again. Um, today we are here at um, the Google Campus Warsaw. And um, first of all, of all, I would like to thank uh, Przemek, who will give you an inspiration talk on his um, startup projects uh, in the field of artificial intelligence. I have no clue what your projects are about, but, um, um, well, Przemek is actually one uh, of the smartest persons I know. He's a mat mathematician uh, with a PhD from Paris. Um, then he was at the University of Oxford for several years, and now he came back uh, to Poland. And he's also a resident here at Google Campus with one of your projects. So, um, yeah, it will be like a short um, talk for 20 minutes, and after that um, we will have a discussion. Then we have a break, yeah, so don't worry about it. And um, yeah, what is also important, I would like to thank um, the Google campus um, because we are getting this really large uh, lecture room completely for free. Yeah, so we will have a short um, introduction on Google campus, how it works, about the philosophy, yeah, but it's important that, that you know that actually this is like not a commercial event, yeah, it's absolutely, we get it for free, uh, and the idea of Google campus is actually to, to foster um, entrepreneurial initiatives, yeah, and as our initiative fits well into this, um, they decided to provide us with this workshop area, so um, I think this is really, really great, yeah. Okay, so... Uh, um, thank you very much, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure. Thank you, Maciek, for the invitation to talk uh, about my background. So I t try to tell you how it all started. So my background is in pure science. I did a PhD in uh, very abstract mathematics uh, on the verge of um, algebraic geometry number theory, representation theory. That has nothing to do with real life. Um, so I, I started in, uh, I started in uh, Paris for five years. I was there for my master and my PhD. Uh, then I went to Oxford where I was uh, a research fellow for two years. So I mostly did research also in pure mathematics. But I, at some point I realiz realized that I would like to have some more impact on like real life problems. And also because my domain was very narrow. There's like 200 people around the world who can comprehend what's happening. And it's really hard sometimes to verify the correctness. So, you know, like mathematics is like, it's an ivy tower where you actually, it's very hard to climb. And then there are only a couple of people who can verify the correctness. So I think the breaking point for me was that I had, um, with two friends, we were writing a mathematical paper for around two years plus one year of uh, corrections. Uh, and the, when that was like, very hard mathematics. My, one, one of the friends were from Columbia, the other was uh, at Princeton at the time. When we finished it, there was basically for half a year, nothing, just silence. We put it online and there was nothing. Then only after like a year, we, we were invited to conferences, the paper got some traction, it was interesting to other people, but actually because the field is so narrow and it's so hard to understand what's going on, it's really hard uh, to, to get like, to a point where your, your work is really um, interesting to, to, to others. So at this point, I also was thinking about how to automate the whole process. So how to, because you need other mathematicians to verify your correct, the correctness of your papers, uh, and how to make it less dependent on other people. And this is how I went into artificial intelligence, thinking about how you can automate the process of verifying proof of uh, proofs of or like th the whole process of actually doing research doing mathematics mm. this is how i started deep algebra project which was about automating mathematics and still ongoing it's like the research program for the next 20 years basically uh, but around the same time i started ulam ai that's a that's the, the first company i started and it, at, at the beginning, I didn't have a clue what I was doing, basically. I was, uh, my idea was that, okay, I was learning some machine learning. That was cool. I, I can consult some companies because I, I know a lot of people. Uh, I came back already to Poland. I, I knew I wanted to come back after those seven years abroad because the experience I got abroad was so unique that I, can, I thought that I can apply it here and get like a unique viewpoint, unique perspective, and be in a very unique place. And that was true. Like There was a little... A little really a lot of people who wanted to talk with me at the beginning. But what I was doing at the beginning was basically uh, consulting at 
about machine learning, how you apply automation proce procedures and stuff like that. So there was no product involved, no bigger picture at the beginning. And slowly it started to get traction and then I was thinking about harder projects. So around the same time, that was May 2017, so over a year now, um, I met Enyo, uh, who's uh, my co-founder at Brink. So this is one of the companies who's, uh, which I'm running and Brink is basically based here in uh, uh, Google campus right now. So we're in residency class two. So this is a startup which is um, at this point supported by Google and what we're doing is basically Uber for services. So we basically run around the city a couple of couriers and you can order the stuff from point A to point B. Uh, and we can deliver that to you in like 60, 90 minutes, basically. So it's like, if you know about Postmates, then it's that direction. So we like building, yeah. So, 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 so that, that's, the, that's the stuff that started basically a year ago. Now we have a nice traction and it's slowly growing. Um, but, and we want to integrate like chatbots, uh, more of machine learning into like how you automate the whole process. But besides that, what I'm trying to build is like, I have a larger picture for what I'm trying to do right now. So the whole idea is that what I'm passionate about is artificial general intelligence. So the whole idea, if you haven't heard about it yet, is that researchers are trying to automate the human creativity in the way that that can fasten the whole development of the world. So basically what you can do is that you can automate parts of research, for, uh, research in medicine or res like uh, researching for new drugs or very important, like use in general machines to try to tackle very hard problems that humans have problems with. Mm, so my whole idea is that uh, at the moment what I'm doing is venture building in AI, meaning I have a couple of companies who complement each other in different directions. So basically, Ulam AI at the moment is a brand. It's like Alphabet to Google uh, at this point. Um, and we have a couple of brands running from logistics to fashion, basically. Uh, and we're doing research in audio vision, uh, text recognition, uh, and text processing. And they complement each other in a way that's very interesting, I guess, and it's hard to start them all at the same time. So Brink is only one example. Uh, also, what I have is, for example, a company which is building only chatbots, chat chatbots and audiobots, actually. So that's, that started basically from going back to what I was doing in uh, mathematics. So if you try to verify the correctness of the proofs, then you have to, the first step is to try to understand the text itself. So the common problem you have is how do you go from you have clue A, B, and how do you reason to get C? Mm. So this is like the very crucial point because if you want to have a meaningful conversation, then your chatbot should be able to understand what you talk with it about and the whole context actually. So starting with this research, we're now investigating chatbots and basically applying that mm, to create chatbots for banks or like telecommunication companies because that's like a, a very pressing problems for them, especially if you, especially with audio. So if you, like if you're trying to call the call center, then you probably have this long waiting queue and you know some voice saying to you that you have to wait for the consultant. So the way to, to, uh, to, to solve this problem is actually you automate the whole process. So you have, um, you have a machine, that's what, for example, what UPS is doing already. If you call the line, then you will get like a machine who's trying to automate the whole process and make it faster. And you just say like, okay, I want to send the delivery from here to there and it's fully automated to some extent because if it doesn't understand your accent or like whatever, then basically you get the live consultant still. But the whole idea is that you can make the whole process faster. Um, so that came directly from my research from mathematics. Um, and also, so at this point still, um, I'm, okay, maybe I, I talk firstly about other projects and then what was hard really in this transition from academia to business and how it, uh, on the whole, um, as, as a whole. So the other project is in fashion. Uh, basically, what's 
I don't know how much you know about fashion, but the, the, the biggest actual issue is uh, time because fashion is getting quicker and quicker. And it's like a very important issue for uh, designers to get their, their new clothes to the market. And actually, there are a couple of bottlenecks along the way. So one of them is at the very last stage, you have the post-production. So you organize the whole session. Imagine you have already have the design, uh, you send the sample, you already have even the, the samples, and what you have to do the last step is actually to organize a session. So you have to organize models, you have to have photographer, retouchers, and you do all that, but then the final part is that actually after you do all the photos, then you still have to do the post-production. And that takes a lot of time at the moment, because if you imagine that, for example, a girl has a tattoo on her hand, that's like a very, very hard problem, then actually you have a guy who's trying to cover that tattoo pixel by pixel, uh, ma basically manually. And you could, at this level, at this point, uh, with the technology we have, you can basically do that automatically to some extent. So this is some, what, one of the issues that we're tackling at the moment. So trying to automate the whole point, the, the whole retouching uh, of s photos used in the photo sessions. So that, uh, the problem is basically this. If you have brands like Zalando, Zara, they have like very standard pictures, photos on their pages. It's basically like uh, front, back, uh, and turn left or li right. So it's not very artistic. So you can imagine that you can automate that to some extent. So this is what we're trying to do. Um, fasten the, the whole process of fast fashion to make it even faster. So that's the, so that's the vis vision component. Um, and then we also have the, co uh, the computing component with, um, so that's the company which is by now, the sub company of Ulan, which is uh, by far the largest, it's board technologies. Uh, and the whole idea is that we're trying to use quantum computers in logistics. So if you haven't heard about quantum computers, it's basically the new way of computing which can be used uh, for some of the problems, especially optimization problems. So, so that's why we, we're trying to do that in logistics. Um, the only problem is that they're like quite large, they're hanging from the ceiling and you have to, they have to be uh, cooled down to absolute zero and stuff like that. So it's not like you can uh, have them in your pocket. It's basically you have to access them through the cloud and they're ex extremely expensive. But the upside of using them is so large that actually the, the speed is growing, the, the computational power is growing exponentially. So it's worth playing the game and trying to build quantum algorithms to use that uh, to solve problems because the problem we're trying, for example, to solve, the, the whole traffic problem is that imagine you have autonomous cars and you have millions of them. And at some point, you would like to have like, the, the whole mind who's controlling the city in a way that the traffic flows smoothly so that it up unblocks your roads because that's a huge problem in every city, right? Whether it's Warsaw, Berlin, or any other city, like with the number of cars, the whole traffic stops, you have traffic jams, and you would like to avoid that. So one way of doing that is trying to control the city at the larger level and control the lights, control, like have the input from all the cars by, by the means of GPS or some other devices that you implement in the car. But that's hard because you have enormous data going live and you'd like to analyze that live also. So this is one of the problems we're tackling here. Okay, so this is like the uh, overview of where I'm currently involved in, in terms of projects. Mm. As, as you see, like fr from, the, from the technological side, all of them are kind of moonshots, ideas that, but in, in the sense they're like also very practical. We have like, we, we still like do very practical business doing B2B partnerships. Uh, we have small clients, we're starting small, going big. Uh, we have investors from some, some of the projects. Mm. And for me, it's interesting the whole journey because also I'm, I'm at the beginning. I'm, I feel still like this is only the beginning. It's like we haven't gone past the seat round with any of the projects. It's basically at the seat level, most of them. Mm. But building the whole, the, the whole structure is very interesting. And also like going back to, with my background, it was very hard to actually make the switch from science to business because I felt like 
I don't know enough. Like I, I don't have this background in business like you do. And like, what should I do? Should I, like, is it okay for me to start a company? Or, like, what my friends in science would say about it? And actually, they said it's it's like you shouldn't do that. Like, the the the, the feedback I got at the beginning was that you're crazy. Like, what are you doing? Like, you have a very nice position in academia. Saying that, like. You, you, you were already in Oxford. What are you doing here? Like, what, why are you starting a startup? Uh, and I said that I don't care about that because I want to do like what's what's really mine. And in the end, that was a very good choice. So after two years of like struggling with that, I don't know what I what I'm doing basically, but going in a good direction because I felt that's a good direction. I felt that I wanted to do things on my terms because academia, to some extent, even though I, I love science, I hate academia. <laughs> because uh, academia gives you like a very clear bounds what you can do and what you cannot. So science is very important. Like whenever you want to do like innovative company, like do, doing anything innovative, I think you need a company to do that because then the whole process is much faster. Uh, because when you have a company, then you need to earn money and think about the whole business models and make it viable. And then also you have more freedom. Whereas in academia, when you have like a very steady position. You can you can uh, make mistakes, and then you're if you make a mistake, then you're not really responsible for what you're doing because you know like it's just research. It's like you write a paper. If you fail, then you write another paper about the failure. That's okay. But if you lose in business, then you basically lose money, and that's that that's tough to do. And you're also responsible uh, be, be, like with your investors, with your coworkers, with your co-founders. Uh, so that's a lot of pressure, um, but for me, this kind of pressure is something I, I look for because it also gives you the motivation to actually do stuff. Um, so over, overcoming that and my way of actually transitioning from academia into business was that I w realized that I'm looking for challenges and even more challenges on like the personal level. Uh, and this kind of thing that mm, I, I, I couldn't find anywhere as done in actual, actually doing business. So uh, in the end, all the, I like put aside all the critics and basically what I did was starting a company and learning along the way, uh, which was the best choice I have ever made. Okay, so I finish here and I'm open to questions. There's a mic inside. Where is it? It's for the, it's for the recording, actually. Yeah, you just talk to okay. the you just talk to the box. Cool. <laughs> nice. This feels totally cool. Uh, thank, uh, thanks for the talk. It was really interesting. Um, my first question would be, uh, how is the relationship to Google like? Um, how does it work here? Are you like getting just the area, or do they own stakes, or? Yeah. So no. So so Google just only gives you free office plus different activities. So for example, the main activity was happening two weeks ago. They, br they brought Googles from around the world, uh, 20 people from Google, uh, from Australia to the US, to actually work with each startup separately. So this is what they give. They, they give you mentoring and knowledge, but they take nothing in exchange, basically. But it's like, it's a, like you have to apply those, like um, we're one of nine startups who got past the the, 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 whole, the whole application process. Uh, yeah, thank you for your presentation. Um, I was wondering how you keep track of uh, so many businesses, especially since the, I have a feeling most of them are in the same phases. So it's not like you can just leave one aside for a bit and then pick it up later. How do you do that? Uh, yeah, so uh, th that, that's the one of the most important part I didn't say anything about, uh, co-founders. That, that's the key. Like, if, if you have people you can rely on, then it's the key. I mean, none of this business I'm running myself. So all of them are uh, with one co-founder or two co-founders, or like, and, and I have already like hiring people on the board. Uh, and you have to trust those people in order to do that because that, that's the first thing. So, so uh, I know that if I leave that to some extent, then one of them is also responsible for the business and can do that. Um, and the other thing is that all of those businesses are quite similar in the sense of technology. So I'm mostly as responsible for the technological part. 
and that's why we have a lot of syner synergy inside the group. The, the operational part is very different for each business. But then you have to be very smart about how you, how you hire people for the operations and how, and how you find your partners, co-founders in the business. Um, hi. Um, you mentioned a service for couriers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, is there any kind of auto automatization or, or machine learning that you are applying to that business, or because yeah, this I is what didn't got it? Uh, so yeah, yeah. yeah. So so uh, at this point we're doing research, but the, the thing is th there are two directions of do, like applying machine learning to that. First thing is uh, using chatbots because the service is that at this point we have a consultant who like you write on f Facebook Messenger to us saying that okay I want like an umbrella to uh, deliver to that uh, to that address, but you would like to have that automated, meaning you to, to have a really a, a chatbot to conversate with. And the other part, which is even more tricky, is uh, or maybe not, um, is automating how you pick the packages along the way. So it's like kind of the Uber problem, which gives you like you know the the fastest the the, the car which is the closest plus um, the, the, the like it, it counts how many. How, how much minutes will you wait and stuff like that. But here it's a little bit harder because you're picking up different uh, packages and then you have to distribute along the way. So you ha somehow have to make the optimal choices. It might be that you collect first three packages from three different addresses and only later on you will deliver them to like different routes. So that's, yeah. So you were talking about very like advanced uh, AI usage. Um, but I think, you know, it's a very like popular topic right now, but I f have a feeling that our markets are not like 100% ready to like take advantage out of it. And I feel like it has been like, it's limitless. We can do really a lot, but how do you feel about profitability of it? Because yes, of course it's possible. We know it's okay. Like Google does it but they have so much more capital and like for a s like smaller startup to really like implement cool technology that will make it user friendly and really working you really need a lot of uh, like smart people that are not cheap to make it work and developers software engineers so how do you make it how do you make a margin out of this uh, like advanced technology okay so they are like two points in that because so first of all some of the technologies are not that smart meaning like if you get like to supervised learning that, that you know like you have neural regression right which is basically statistics so machine learning at the the first layer is just statistics and you can take like any smart mathematical students physics student and like okay I, like I teach them personally to some extent saying what, what they can do that, so that fastens the process but actually the, the, like the, the first part, and so, so that's also the thing that, uh, that that's also the thing that you can sell very quickly because you don't even have to say that oh artificial intelligence machine learning. You just say we will automate your processes to some extent. You just give us, give us your processes, or like we can like go for for a consulting and, and start with that. So if you start small with stuff like that, that, then you can really bring them value quickly using. That's machine learning, but that's like a very basic machine learning. So, so that, that's one part. It's much harder to do that with like the, if you do like much, much more complicated stuff. So, so for example, the things we're doing in Tashin, uh, it's very tricky. And I still don't know whether we will be profitable or not in the end. I've heard that it's like, actually my friends are working on somehow like artificial, like machine learning to improve the quality of the photo. And it's actually, it's not that difficult, but maybe to do you know, to erase something automatically could be a bit harder. But also I'm thinking, you know, if you're doing this chatbot and like Google recently, re like um, they released Duplex. this phone Google Duplex, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's like live and you can just make an appointment on her dresser. But I think this is like super advanced. It's It sounds very simple, but you know, to- Yeah, it is super advanced. Conversation, it's but okay, but imagine something in between because what we're talking here, like, if you have a bank, even if like it's a bank in Germany or like in, in Poland or anywhere else you're in CE, it won't go to Google asking, okay, I want to buy your uh, chatbot you're having. Because first of all, I don't think like Google are s s is selling some of this technology. 
But on the other hand, they need something, which is much, much easier to do because they only need that in very narrow domain. So they only need to, like, you know, like what Google is doing shows you the capacity of what we can do today. But what, for example, banks or telecommunications company needs is much lighter, much easier to do. So this is not this kind of technology. So, so we have like banks or other companies coming to us saying, okay, we've, we've seen this Google duplex and then what can you do? Like, can, can we apply some of this, this to our business? And it's easier, like it, it's doable, even if you don't have this tera, tera, terabytes of data that Google has. Um, and also we're choosing, like data is also one of the issues, but if you have technology, like for example, with these photos, I, I imagine they're using something like generative adversarial networks, which is for boosting out, boosting the quality from normal to HD. And this is also what we're trying to uh, do w w with this photo sessions. This is one of the components that we need. And the funny thing is that here, we're at the same level at, uh, as probably Google because you have all these fashion pictures on the internet. And like every, every store, Zalando, like you have lots of data that you can use. So that's, that's not the issue here, for example. So, hi. Uh, so when you were talking about Google Assistant, um, it was a lot of fuss about that uh, it, it's making like sounds like human, like mm -hmm, uh, And like I'm uh, curious of your or opinion. So you think should it be like said from the beginning that we are talking with a machine or rather not? Should it be recognizable or should we keep it like very natural and human? like? because it's more attractive and interesting? No, so personally, I, I would go to like try to imitate the human and see whether I can fool humans. But actually what companies are trying to do is like, again, if you're a blank telecommunication company and if you have a client calling to your customer service and then it sounds natural at the beginning, but then you realize that it's a bot, like it's, a, it, it's not a machine, then you get very irritated. And you would never, like, you would, like, really be very irritated. So they're not trying to do that. So they're trying, like, they, they fr from the very start, they signal to you that you're talking with a chatbot or an audio bot. So that's the direction at the moment. Hey, um, yeah, yesterday we had a lecture um, at um, SGH, and... Uh, the professor said that there are like two um, perspectives on artificial intelligence. So one is op the optimistic perspective, saying, "Okay, that's uh, you know great because it will allow to develop much quicker and uh, help um, humanity." And there is this pessimistic perspective, saying, "Okay, that actually this is a, like a big risk." And I think Elon, Elon Musk is like a, the re representing the, the pessimistic perspective. What is your perspective on this? That would be very interesting to me. I'm very optimistic. <laughs> okay, but why? Um, because otherwise I probably wouldn't do it. <laughs> no, I, I'm optimistic because like, what's the, what's the alternative? Like you have like no alternative in, in, in a way that people will do, will work on artificial intelligence anyway. So it's better, it, it better works out in a good direction than not. <laughs> so me, meaning that uh, I'm trying to do as much good in this area as possible because if it's not me or similar to me, like people who have like kind hearts and trying to do something good for the world, then it would be like, I don't know, North Korea, China, or like uh, do, do, nothing against them, but you know, like it, it might be like, you will have like one agent who has like very amazing technology and he will use that in, in, in a very bad direction. But you have no choice at this moment. So I'm optimistic in the sense that there are many good people working on, uh, on AI and trying to make open, like deep mind or like, okay, that's Google right now. But uh, open AI, for example, which is, you know, like a foundation founded by Elon Musk, for example, exactly with this goal, um, you have a foundation in the US with people working on uh, researching AI, uh, the best possible technology and making it very open. So, so th I think that's a good direction. Hello, um, I would like to ask you about like uh, in, AI, in AI today, 
um, we see that uh, it's working pretty well with like huge data sets and with images like ImageNet and stuff like this. But what's your vision on AI, like the biggest problems with working with audio files and audio recognition? Because I think with uh, like voice assistance, this will get to pretty, pretty much like in on demand in the near future. Okay, so actually, I, I guess one of the breakthroughs in recent years was uh, the work of DeepMind and there's something called WaveNet. I don't know if you've heard about it. Like if you can Google that and basically, um, they, they, of course, that, that's part of Google right now, so they have like immense data. But what they can do is that they can learn the voice of a human being to the extent that it's still like mm, pauses and it's, it sounds very natural. Even if like it stops, it, it stops for breathing, like it, it reads the sentence and then you have natural pauses for breathing. So that's pretty amazing. And there's a, a huge re recent research on that. Like if you Google WaveNet and, and, and went, well, go into that direction, then you will find out about it. But it's like, yeah. But uh, do you uh, see one specific like technical problems on working with like uh, audio recognition other than with uh, data, just raw data or image data? Is there like a, yeah, what's I the biggest difference and what's the biggest challenge? Well, well the, big, <laughs> the big challenge is that you have a lot of noise. So that, that's like if you're speaking on the telephone and if you're trying to recognize, or even if you're at the, say, for, for example, that's something big in China right now, like Alibaba has different kiosks where you can buy, buy voice on a, on a station. And the thing, like, th that's the, the amazing thing they're doing, actually. I think Alibaba is even more um, advanced than Google in this, uh, in this respect because they are, they are able to understand your voice where you're sta standing in, like, a huge crowd people screaming around and it takes your voice and actually un understands what you're trying to get from the kiosk. But uh, most of this stuff is not available publicly. Like, I, I, I don't know how, they, how they're doing that. But like, the, the there's a like, big challenge with noise around. And, like, and also like noise around and like saying what's noise and what's not noise. Uh, you talked about the company where you do machine learning um, with uh, logistics. Um, could you talk a bit about um, what, like, what it is that you improve there, and how 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 much of improvement is is happening there? Sure. Um, mm, so what we are actually concerning at is um, the computational part of the very hard problem. So I give you an example which I like uh, the most. Uh, so imagine you're running a, an airline, right? And you have, so every day you have a full schedule of flights. And then one of the planes is out, like it's broken. And um, the passengers are waiting. And, the, the, like, and you get to know about this, this plane only one hour before the flight. What do you do, right? So now what you have to do, like what they're doing right now is that they're rescheduling different flights in a way that, okay, you get delayed 15 minutes here because the plane is going there, and then you put this plane here, and then for replacement, just go here, and like that. But the thing is that it, it, it's very tricky because once you get late too much, like it, for, the, for example, in the EU, I guess it's like if you get uh, late more than four hours, then you are allowed to like the full allowance or something like, or a big, at least, I don't know, th there's an amount you get from, and, the, and the, like, Plus, you have to count in the, the cost of fuel traveling from one direction to the other, the, the cost of like passengers being angry at, that direct, at this particular destination, and you have to count it all in. So starting with like the very small issue of one plane, you suddenly get like a immense puzzle that you're trying to take like into one thing, and then you're trying to minimize the losses, but you have to do it real time. And that's the, so th this kind of problem, you cannot solve it right now with the current computing power. So they're doing, they, they're using some, they're using a little bit of computers, but then you have experts on transportation scheduling and they say, okay, then in the end you have to make it right like that, they, they make choices. But if you want to, to solve it completely by computers, uh, you need to have much more computer power. And this is when, where we ca come in, and basically we're trying to use quantum computers which are much more capable in uh, 
computing power to solve this kind of problem. So basically, just to say it briefly what quantum computers are, if you hear it for the first time, because they're, they're already working on ex examples, they're still weaker than the classical machines. So uh, computers are easy, like you have transistors, right, and you just put it linearly, and it depends how much you put, then this, you, this much computer power you will have. And uh, they're based on bits, right, which you can model by saying that the light is on or off, and that's okay. But say you model it differently. You model it that you have a ring and you uh, throw an electron at it. And if it goes left, then it's zero, and if it goes right, then it's one, right? Uh, so quantum computers, mm, it's a funny quantum effects uh, call, called entanglement. So just to say it, I would be a little bit cheating, but just to give you an idea. So if this ring is made out of superconductor, it's almost in absolute zero, you have no gravitational waves, then what can happen is actually this electron can go both left and right. And you have the third possibility. So you, the quantum bit is like zero, one, two, or two is zero, one. Um, but the funny thing is now that if you put these rings together, then they can interfere with each other. So your speed of computing is going exponentially in terms of rings and not linearly. So suddenly, if you're able to do this kind of thing, then you're getting computers which are faster than if you even cover the whole Earth with tr the classical transistors. So, so that's the idea. Uh, it doesn't work at the moment. That's the only problem. <laughs> because you, like, it's very tricky to put those rings together because they interfere with each other. It's very easy to actually make the whole calculation incorrect. So there are different issues. But, but that's the direction we're doing. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it works to some extent. I mean, you can put, like, for example, uh, I think at the moment, like, uh, 16, 32 rings together, and that's okay. But it's still, too, like, too low number to, to make it better than, like, the classical computers. Hi. Um, you talked about the importance of people being, like, reliable. Can you tell us a bit about how did you found your co-founders and which characteristics were you looking for? Um, yeah, that's a very good question. So uh, I have, like, it's by trial and errors, but actually I picked the people that actually came from my social background, basically, meaning that I, made, I, I met them socially, not at startup events, and we started talking not about business. Okay, so maybe with Anya, so which I'm with whom I'm running Brink, so the company here, I met by, uh, at the whiskey degustation party, and we started talking about alcohol because he was running a bar already. So the story was that, he's, so actually he's running one of the most famous bar in Warsaw, uh, Six Cocktails, highly recommended. They have like, it's like a speaky easy bar. You have to know where to enter in order to go there. Uh, and at that point, I wanted to, 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 to have my own bar, and he wanted to do artificial intelligence. So we started talking like that uh, about this. Uh, and then in the, in the end, he convinced me that uh, having a bar is not so, such a cool thing, and actually that's a lot of work, and it's not scalable, blah, blah, blah. Uh, okay, so, so, so that's how we basically started thinking about Brink, and it came naturally because that was also one of his needs uh, while running a bar, that you have someone who you can send to bring you stuff. Mm. So, so that, that was very natural. Uh, with my other partner, uh, who is actually, at the moment, he's doing PhD in law, uh, we met also for common friends, and it started out of a business, but we started uh, by applying for, like, EU funds, which didn't work out in the end. But in the process of, like, applying for, th for this, that was, like, very intense, like, getting letter of intents, like, interesting investors. Uh, we decided that even if we don't get it, we stick together and do some more stuff, and that was the best decision. But uh, so, so somehow, mm, that was like very natural because you do the, in, like the, the first part of your work, and then you see how, how it goes. I had like, like, of course, I had like different stories. I mean, I also like have other stories with my uh, co-founders which didn't work out. So, uh, I, I like. One of the stories was that basically I was kicked out of the startup that I founded. That was like <laughs> uh, two years ago. That was, uh, well, that, that's, that was interesting at the part. <laughs> that was hard to take in, but then like I needed a couple of months to take that in and then uh, retry again. Mm. But that, that's like, you, you have to risk it, and but 
if I feel the personal connection, it's like with your friends. I, I don't like, like, because you have to know that you will be spending with this person so much time that you have to like it, that you have to like him or her, because otherwise it's pointless, right? So, and that, that's like, that, that's like, that's the most, like, apart from having like complementary skills, which is very important, you have to feel good socially with that person because it's pointless otherwise. I uh, recently heard um, a talk about a Microsoft-supported PhD project where they used deep learning to identify uh, illegal mining activities in Ghana based on satellite pictures. And like one of the major problems was um, that it took very long and also a lot of noise in terms of like certain things in the in the pictures that were distracting like for identifying clear patterns um, and you were talking that in fashion that's also very difficult uh, like that there are also like certain problems could you elaborate more on these like what's what's the problem why is it so difficult like because like that there's a, as you said a huge data set of pictures examples that could facilitate like yeah but uh, I think it's different kind of problem because um, so one area of research is anomaly detection and this is probably what goes into this project that you want to say what is anomaly and what is what you're looking for so for example like the, the best example for that is say you want to automate the production of genes in a factory and you have a, cam a camera and basically you're trying to s spot you have like a very complicated pattern actually like you know, like genes, genes are simple, but I, for the machine, you have all these lines, and then you want to say that if one line is going like that, then actually it's an anomaly, so you should take it out, right? So, so it starts to get very hard, uh, and, and this is a very hard problem. Uh, also, th this problem with satellites, it seems like it's very hard because you want to say exactly, uh, first of all, I imagine that uh, terrain might, might be an issue like different facilities which is really mining facility which is not so you get like a lot of complexity in fashion it's simple in the sense that we're going fr from the other direction because we already know what's an anomaly in the sense that we can show it like you know like in a sense that the the, the thing we're doing it's like it's not for like it's the other direction because we want no anomalies in our thing so we're only learning like teaching the machine on the standard set. And then if you have like, I don't know, like hair which is going like that and you want to cut it out, then the, the machine will spot it almost automatically because it will know that something is not right with your hair, right? So, so that's the that's same kind of problem, but completely different approach and different problems on a way. And the base is like an ideal type kind of like yeah, yeah, that, that, yeah, yeah, but the techniques, yeah, that, that in a sense, yes, but you can, mm, yeah, in, in a sense, it's ideal type, but then you can, you can have like different technologies and different approaches to, to this problem of how you, uh, and whether you're more concerned with anomaly or are you more concerned with just um, generating the, the picture? Because, you know, like our, our main thing is that we have a pack shot. Pack shot means you know, like ju just the cloth with no hands, no uh, no um, no face, and we put the model inside, right? The, uh, the artificially generated model. So it's a different kind of problem because um, we actually like the anomalies here are like w it's not really about anomalies. It's about um, learning what's the ideal thing and reproducing that, but to that extent that it's not uh, distinguishable from a, for a human eye. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, there's a screen, beware. Like <laughs> Hi. Um, I was curious about what you think the future trends of research and application are for other, other kind of applications for inter AI, for example, and because I was reading a lot lately about, for example, the future of smart grids and how smart cities not only for traffic will, will function, but also for other applications we might think will be relevant in the future. 
That's a very broad question. <laughs> no, so actually, kind like of, uh, just examples of what you think could be the directions oh, is very broad as well. Um, okay, so. Uh, uh, okay, cities are interesting. So, for example, um, you can. Th that's interesting to look at uh, China, for example, where they try. They have like a centralized government and they can do whatever they want. So they're doing like different, very funny stuff because uh, you have three main components. You have Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent. So it's like Facebook, Google, and uh, Amazon, basically. Uh, and they cooperating with the government uh, very closely. And they can do all, all, like very interesting stuff. For, so for example, uh, in Hangzhou, that's a, one of the biggest cities in China, which you haven't heard about, uh, then you, that you have the in fully integrated solution uh, for the city. There's something called Alibrain, which runs the city, uh, which basically means it changes the lights so that the traffic goes faster. Uh, they have autonomous cars uh, on their roads already. Uh, so you have the fully integrated solution for the city, and that's like the first testing ground uh, for how you can make different autonomous technologies part of your city so that it's at least to some extent safe for humans. Uh, there's a similar project like that in Toronto called Sidewalk run by Google, um, but on much l smaller scale. Uh, so one of the trends would be definitely around traffic and how human commute to work, like how they organize their travel, whether it's autonomous cars or like so something different. Uh, but the general trend of like how you want to use artificial intelligence is smoothness of everything. So it's basically like what uh, as millennials want to do is like you have one click and you receive the thing you want. Like right, you, you want to you want a new clothes, bang. You one click on the telephone and you have it. Um, and with every, you, you want to have everything like that, right? So you ima you can imagine like autonom autonomous Uber, which already actually runs to some extent in California, that you can basically order a car, then the car uh, drives to you with no, with no driver, the door's open, you go in, you, you drive to the next location. Uh, buses with autonomous buses. Um, so there's, and also, you want to somehow have the very smooth process of living. And, and that's like the very broad uh, direction that we're going into. But like, the, you have like many, many different applications. It's hard to mention them. Just wanted to hear you. Yeah. Um, because you were just mentioning smoothness, at the moment, I feel like interacting with chatbots, audio bots, artificial intelligence in general, like between human and machine, it's not very smooth yet. Do you think that there will be much more improvement within the future? Or what do what you think is necessary to, to make a smooth process for that? Okay, you know, it, it's kind of funny because actually you're already integrated with your machine, meaning you have a smartphone, yeah, and you know, like 90% of, like most of the people uh, in uh, Western Europe have their phone within one meter 90% uh, uh, of time. Th that shows that we are already like ki kind of integrated with machines. So uh, sure, it's not like uh, we can talk with machines with chatbots, like with chatbots and audio bots, but on the other hand, we have like, uh, for example, you, you, you search on Google, you, you use your social media uh, to do a lot of stuff. And that's already kind of integration. So I, I, don't, like, I don't think like, for example, you will um, necessarily need uh, chatbots for like personal use. You will need them like to communicate with a, with a brand, with a company, like uh, with, with your bank. That, that will be just useful. So this whole smoothness goes into that direction that you can, um, somehow use, you, you know, like the next step probably will be, like telephone is also is un, un, unhandy in the sense that you have to think about it, you have to remember where you placed it, you have to have it in your pocket, the battery runs out. So you can imagine that if there is a solution which basically integrates with you directly and it's not too painful, then people will do that, right? If you can have like a chip which you just put on your, like a plaster which you put on your hat, then you do that.
But with all the machine learning and stuff like automatic clerks and you don't basically like uh, low paying jobs become less necessary because yeah. instead of having a person who's actually following you, it's all machine. How would you try to solve that problem? Because like a large population would then be jobless at the end. Yeah. So it's even funnier because for example, my biggest goal is actually to automate creative jobs. I want to like have consultants out of their jobs. I want to have scientists out of their jobs. So that's like, a, I think bigger issue. <laughs> <laughs> so whatever you want to do, I want to out of your job like in 10 years, basically. Uh, but the, the idea is that a couple of things. So for, that, that's fun, of course, to put it. But um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's just the fact, you know, like there will be new jobs created along the way. So the, the, the worry that uh, you're expressing is basically the worry that people had already in 19th century with industrial revolution in the UK, for example, when you have new industry like. People were saying, okay, there are these new machines, who will do this stuff? Because you know, you have machines who can actually sew jeans and stuff like that. So the answer, I guess, is we don't know what will happen next. Like what will be the jobs of the future that will come? But it, yeah. I'm, I, I'm okay until like 12, yeah, 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 sure, sure. Like, no, we can go on, like, I'm having fun. I'm having like, <laughs> I, um, so in this digital uh, economy, I think that the new paradigm that is uh, this data is crafting is the uh, attention economy. So now the most valuable companies like uh, Google, Facebook, are basically satisfying um, your attention by making everything smooth, by giving you a great news feed, by putting on top the best uh, um, results. Um, I also wonder, um, what's the limit of uh, these applications? Because I think that this is also a great tool to manipulate masses. I believe that this is, uh, and I don't want to say this in a, um, do you say, like a complotistic way? <laughs> but um, just to, I mean, we already saw that uh, some events are happening because of social media. And um, I believe that uh, this has to in a certain way be prevent. Um, so what do you think about this? And uh, what do you think about this use of uh, data and uh, this application? Okay. Uh, no, so you definitely I, I agree with the thing that it's all about the attention that uh, it, and it's like one of the most precious asset that you can, you, you can have because no, no matter what you're doing, whether it's like in real life relationships or business, you need attention of someone to actually get your business done or like do whatever it needs. So, and these platforms like Facebook or like YouTube or Snapchat, Instagram, whatever, uh, they trading attention and then like based on attention. And then there are people like, you know, influencers are influencers because they have your attention and they, it, because they w worth so much and they will be worth even more because they get the attention of masses and basically they, they like the, Middleman be behind, like in between companies and uh, clients at the same time. So if you're a big brand and you want to get like I don't know one million people, then you get to, you go to the influencer at this point and like do the campaign with him or her. Mm. Yeah, so 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 that's like the, the attention is very important and of course it's manipulative, but. Uh, it always, it always was and it always will be. Like television is manipulative, radio is manipulative, but people have free will. Like it's funny like with this, you know, I, I, I understand that you're alluding to this uh, like affair with Cambridge Analytica and like Donald Trump g getting chosen by, because of the different social media campaigns that he got. Uh, sure, but in the end, it, they w those people weren't forced to do that. You know, like they were targeted very smoothly with the right, write in pictures, text, articles, but in the end, they could do the research by themselves and decide by themselves. And uh, just to follow up, I, I um, partially disagree with that because yeah. I feel the point that um, when you use something daily and uh, you get um, um, you get used to, to this, to that, to look at your news feed, then you don't even realize that you don't have even the, the will of uh, choose something different or see something different. So. Um, yeah, okay, I see your point. I mean, so, so that's the thing that I, I don't know how to counterfeit in the sen sense that, mm. for example, Facebook is using algorithms to show you things which are 
which you probably will like, right? Exactly. So, that's, that's and it's, it's very hard to get out of the bubble. Like, no. Mm. So, so uh, like, yeah. I don't know whether it should be, like, controlled in a way or people should be more aware of the fact and just, you know, you, you have, like, but if you have, like, there's, like, different problems in, to that. Like, should, like, would you like to limit that to some extent? Would you, like, show people different stuff? Like, it's, it's very hard to do. Uh, there was like thing, things like that w also with Google because uh, while fighting fake news, um, there's a whole deal that if you do Google search on some of the stuff, then you get false responses. Mm. Uh, for, I, I've forgotten right now the, the whole story, but basically they have to make it manually at, the, the, at this point because uh, to, to, to so, so some of the things, because basically when you search for um, I, I, like there was one of the celebrity, and if you search is this person dead, then the, the, the first couple of articles was that yeah he died like last year, but actually he was w very well and uh, living. Um, so they changed that um, manually to show that, but that's like a bigger problem. But that's also like the, the very nice thing about the, the artificial intelligence because you cannot do that manually to everything, and if you want to be fair, then you need to let machines reason on the text so that they, like the Google search will show you the plethora of choices. You will not only have this article about saying that Earth is flat, but also they show you that Earth is actually a circle, or like, you know, like a sphere. Uh, uh, but um, I still believe that um, AI is pushing to, um, is pushing to just one perception of things. So like Google, and so it doesn't allow to, to have different perceptions. Yeah, uh, so I, mean, Dizzy, I, I still believe that uh, at this uh, point, yes, because the, 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 like, it's all based on statistics. Like the the, ver like the, the machine learning itself, like the the, the easiest lever is based on statistics. But that's already an issue, and people are researching that. Like there are some research it, about blockchain that is um, people are using blockchain to decentralize this power and creating different that's perception. What's your point on that? Maybe I like I have no experience with blockchain. Okay, I'm like looking for like. I'm looking forward to more applications, but definitely blockchain might help you in like getting reliable information because you know where it comes from, right? So that's like, but I'm like uh, uh, careful at the moment about blockchain and how it's. Um, I think like maybe, well, an in another point, maybe right now there's a lot of people who are kind of adverse to, to technology. Like, do you think that's gonna be a problem in the future? Like, I don't know, old people that don't want to use, like, they're just starting to use smartphones. Or do you I think mean, there's going to be a point when that's not going to be a problem? Or? I mean, you, you know, it changes, right? Because at some point, we will be old people. Yeah. And that depends, like, uh, so for example, are you scared of robots? Because, I do, like, <laughs> no, <laughs> uh, like, you probably do not have, like, a problem with a smartphone, but what do you think about Sofia? You know, this, like, uh, the, fir the first AI robot that got uh, citizenship in a. Uh, uh, in Dubai or Emirates. Uh, so so I, I think that the limits are being pushed at the moment and there will be some point of like feeling in, of inconvenience for, for you or for anyone else. But I guess uh, at the moment the, I, the, the idea of the like real robot and like interaction with re real robot, that's something inconvenient for most of the people. What's gonna come first? Like that, well, what's gonna happen first? That inconvenience to disappear because we got used to it, or the technology being here and making us feel uncomfortable? I, I think it will probably it will go smoothly because you know, like people in the end, like people won't adapt ma massively different things unless they feel convenient about it. So it won't be like you know, like it won't be like you wake up one day and then you have like all the autonomous cars driving around and then no drivers and no drivers allowed even on the roads. It won't happen like that. It will be like you know, small thing by small thing. Um, I have two things, in fact, maybe on his point. He, he mentioned that people can get influenced by social media in a certain direction, and you say that's a choice of free will, and that for any people can research, etc., etc. But 95% of the population can do that, and it's the only news feed is the of 90%. I don't know how big the, the part is. They can do that. I mean, that they can, but they're not able to, because the, the world for them gets really difficult. For the academia, every all the academia understand no, I, the world, but all the people below that, they can't yeah, get I, that. You know, I mean, 
Yeah, yeah. yeah that's true. But, that, but, you know, but it's hard to make choices for them, right? I mean, because if you want to allow them to see different images also, you're also steering them to some, something else, right? You're trying to uh, also push them in some direction. That's true. But no, ma no matter what you show them, uh, you're pushing them in some direction. And then you have to argue which direction is better. Mm -hmm. But they have free will in the end. And in the end, they can even you know, shut down Facebook. That's like a That's true, choice, but, but all of your friends are in Facebook and there's completely sure, no sure. alternative, so nobody will quit Facebook. That's Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I don't think it's technology, yeah. Because, you know, like in the, in the way, technology is not like, uh, it's more like showing who you, who you are in the end. It's not like pushing us into new directions. It's like, I, I like, yeah. Okay, maybe just one point as an add-on to what you were discussing. I have a background in communication science and basically the same discussion has been going on for 200 years and already to the time when we're, we're discussing diversity in kind of public mediums, it was also the question whether we need a variety of newspapers or not. And at the end it turned out that most people were just using one newspaper, the one that kind of uh, was in line with their own opinion and probably it's it's really not only a question of technology, it's also, I, and I, I mean, I don't want to agree to this point that it's a free will choice, but at the same time, it's nothing so new, I would say. Yeah. 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 Well, it has been the big publishing houses and basically the news agencies, so the news wires behind it were only a couple of global players, and that's still the same. Entire Russia, entire Russia has one newswire agency, and all the information from like a global perspective come from that. Of course, you have the internet, but the internet is full of like lawful information, so you cannot rely on that. And there is no source of objectively true news. Like, <laughs> yeah. But I wanted to ask another question, and it regards our governments. Because you mentioned the Ali brain in China and that it's a very close cooperation with the government, how do you see the position of the European governments, especially maybe Poland or Germany? I always have this impression when I go like to public offices that they are way behind and that they're just starting digitalization and so far away from actually applying artificial intelligence on a like, country scale level and that it's basically the companies having these great ideas about smart cities and not our politicians. Do you think there's a chance that we can <laughs> kind of also govern this process from a more political perspective where we would also have like more moral force behind it and more like... Yeah, yeah so, uh, so actually it's happening to some extent. So th there's like some, um, EU actually got uh, uh, some tax and like some budget on artificial intelligence and like there's also I know that Germany is already talking with Poland actually about creating like a more international institute only for artificial intelligence. And there are like different countries, like France has a budget. Like this, what was happening in like last year is basically each country is trying to develop a um, national strategy for development of artificial intelligence. Because China has one and the US has one. So, but the, the thing, the problem is that uh, that, all, that all sounds very nice. You, you will probably have like nice institutes, but the, the level of money that is being poured into this is just um, funny. Meaning that in China you have like billions of dollars going into that, and in Europe I guess the whole budget is like 50 million, so like 100 million. It's like it's like nothing. It's like Google can spend that like like that. Uh, uh, so so, so that, that's the bigger big, bigger problem here. Uh, actually, but like the direction is good. So politicians are already thinking about how to, like, you, you know, like they know already that it's a big issue and that that can change a lot. Mm. So the only thing is about how it's going to be applied really and how, how you're going to realize the, the vision that they having in the national strategies. And I, I think the, like the, there are really ongoing dialogues between uh, businesses and more governmental part in in all of the European countries, more or less. But it, you know, like the, the the only problem is this: uh, Europe is quite small, and it's very like regular, like 
you have many regulations because of the EU, and because of that, and with GDPR right now, it's like you ju you just uh, limited your AI capabilities even more because you just limited your access to data. So so that's the problem, and because like we, with that, I don't think like we can win with China, be because they have like no limits on the data that you can use, and the government is basically spying on their citizens. Which is a bad thing, of course, but on the other hand, like for the, the, the development of AI, it's a very good thing because they have enormous data and you cannot use that. Yeah, I have a question. Um, you know, when you talked about this like uh, innovation process in airports, logistics, or for example, AI robots helping these elderlies who can't really move their body, when like technologies apply to this kind of purposeful um, activities it is very I think very meaningful but at the at the same time for example automotive um, drivers and also virtual reality like entertainment it seems kind of like a science development for science sake not for like meaningful it's it sounds to me like skeptical and hollow you know what I mean like technology development itself also what was it what we talked no, 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 there was AI in government. Yeah, like you said, like data, like collection, for example, it's better for AI, but I think, you know, it, it should not be mentioned like that or put in right. that way, you know, you know, it's like kind of meaningless. No, but, I, okay, I, I, I see your point, but, I, you know, like, for example, when you get uh, more data, what I meant with this more data, I mean, if you go back to the problem I mentioned, I mentioned before with the traffic, is that, they're using this data to actually actually optimize the traffic flow uh, in the city, meaning uh, you will get to travel much more smoothly with all this data if you can use it correctly. Yeah, but that's also at the same time, they're collecting like private data as well. Yeah, that's a but problem. I mean, it's helpful it's for like data collection will definitely improve um, hmm. science no, like sure. AI or like machine learning in general, but I feel like it's just for just like scientific sake, not for like, Oh, no, no, it's, it's you know for human I mean? sake. No, Sometimes no, I feel like, like okay. sci scientists in general, uh, half of them maybe are like really seeing the technology as science for sake. You know. Oh, no, yeah. I agree with si science part. Like, they're doing science more for ethical. science sake, but you have like companies that be like yeah. playing around, and it's they doing it for business. So they are doing it because they can gain money, and it's funny because, uh, for example, VR is a good example that actually. I totally disagree with you because you mentioned this, you know, elder people and like health problems. That, that's a great direction. That's like the direction especially that Japan, Japan is specialized in. But also the funny thing is that VR is, using, is used for elder people because when you cannot move out of the wheelchair and you're just spending all your days in the hospital, they actually there were like experiments in the UK hospitals that basically they were using VR to show those people around, I don't know, like Israel or like different countries and th th that was like a great improvement of their lives and th the other people loved it really like so that's like you know like some of it is entertainment some of it is pure science but you never know like you, you never know how it get used and but the whole direction is that you know because there's so much business around it that people are trying to make it useful because if you make it useful and practical then someone will buy it someone, someone will buy your product I just mentioned that because sometimes I feel like these applications don't really expect what society, how society will um, will accept the degree of technology. You know, like get between the technology itself. No, and sure, but you know, like I, I think like if the if the society won't accept that, then they go out of business, and that's okay. And that's like how you do market validation. Like this is compl this is fully okay. My question is also going the direction we yesterday um, had a lot of um, perspective on startups and they all had like a direction of um, tech innovation um, and I see ourselves in this uh, world like we're making vast um, improvements in so many processes, we're inventing new materials and so on, it's tremendous. Um, at the same time I see our world 
in a tremendous steps in direction of destruction of this planet um, in loss of um, diversity, loss of, um, um, or we see also the climate change, etc. So my question to you is, um, how do you prioritize and which are the main factors by getting new approaches in creating new startups? So, so you're asking like, what's the motivation? We're like, yes. So, so my, my motivation is the curiosity process. So I really want to know like, uh, okay, so I started with like, I, I really would like to get to the level of human creativeness with machines because then we will be able to solve some of the biggest challenges. So for example, this challenge, like if you want to make research faster, so that's like, if you agree that like, you know, like our planet is dying and then we have like a lot of plastics floating around like in the oceans, uh, then you want to make some of the research faster because, for example, you want to research new drugs or like, and, and help people in some meaningful way. Uh, so that, that's why you would like to have artificial scientists to help the, the real ones in order to really uh, make an impact. So, so that's my motivation. Uh, I also think about the planet, but you know, it's, it's like very hard. Like, but I, I know already that there are like AI companies or like robotics companies who are doing very good job. For example, I know of uh, like uh, in the US, there's like so some company doing uh, robots who actually go on, a, on sand under ocean and take, pick out plastics, plastic bags, pl plastic bottles and stuff like that. So, so that, like, that's very useful. Uh, so I believe, like, I'm really an opti optimist about uh, artificial intelligence and like new technologies. And I think it's a matter of time that some people will in invent a way to like, to do something about climate change. Actually, it's, it's happening already to some extent, you know, because one of the issues about climate change is how much meat we eat, because, you know, like you need a lot of uh, terrain for, uh, for all the cows. Uh, and if you were to eat vegetables, then uh, I'm not vegetarian, unfortunately, but if you were to eat vegetables, then actually uh, you would save a lot of uh, forest this way, and that would go into good direction. So. For example, startups which are working on artificial meat are startups which I like totally support. Because again, uh, I don't believe that you will be able to change human behaviors and say them, okay, stop eating meat. Because, okay, so, some people will do that, but it's like with um, electric cars, right? Like uh, before uh, Elon Musk, there was like electric cars were funny. It's like, you know, you have this funny little car that driving on electric, but nobody serious would buy it. No, no businessman, no like, uh, it wasn't cool, and until you made a car which is really cool and electric, then already in, you know, it, it's like in the process. And it's, it's like that with everything else. So once you will have a startup, which for example, or a company which is building, like making very good food, which is more like artificial, like, and it's made from vegetables, but tastes like meat, like you have a steak every day, but it's very healthy, then people will start to buy it. And that's how, like, that's how I think about uh, making changes, actually, that you want to make things which are good for people, but then they might alter their be behaviors in a good direction so that you save the planet, like, and do something about it. Thank you. Um, you mentioned that switching from academia to kind of business was the best decision ever. And obviously that was a bit of a process with lots of decisions along the way. But I was wondering if you could share one or two moments where you're like, oh yeah, that was definitely the right decision. Uh, so it, yeah, sure. Uh, so it came very late. At, at the beginning it was very hard. So just to give you the background, um, because in pure mathematics, especially in my domain, it's like, it's really the, the, the Langlands program, which I'm doing, it's conceived um, as the hardest thi thing you can do intellectually. So whenever someone was like, you know, even when I was doing PhD, there was this notion that whenever someone is stepping out of academia, he's a loser, basically. Like, you know, like, because he couldn't cope anymore with the science, so he chose business because that's easier, like, he couldn't do that, like, he's a loser. So I have this notion in my head, and that was the hardest thing to do because I couldn't just say, okay, I'm living, like, it, it, it wasn't like changing a company, like, 
going from Google to Facebook or anything like that. It's really like changing a lifestyle, changing the whole environment, going out of the bubble, um, and finding something new. That, that was really hard. And so to some extent, I didn't like didn't really quit really because even when I'm I'm here in Poland, I'm still at the Polish uh, Academy of Polish, Polish Academy of Sciences, uh, which is a research institute that gives me a lot of freedom with respect to my um, research. I don't have to teach, uh, but it's still like I'm in between academia and business, but more into business right now. And it was like a really slow process because of this notion that if, if I go to business, then I'll be a loser. In, uh, you know, like intellectually, that's, that's very strong when you're doing a PhD, and that's a very hard thing to do. Uh, but the, the moments, so that was the whole process. The moments, the one I was mentioning before was this uh, big work with my friends, like, you know, 60 pages of like really deep mathematics and no, no feedback afterwards for, for the next uh, half a year. Uh, and the small moments that I decided, you know, like it, it's a very like it, it's a it's a bubble. It's like 200 people. The, sometimes the, there's something new, someone new coming, but most of the time, it's the same people, and I will get to meet with them around the world for the next 40 years. And is that the future that I want to live in? <laughs> and I said no. Like I, I want to like meet many, many more people, do much more interesting projects, and that won't be happening in academia. So the re realization of this that I have, like you know, like life is short, and there are so many options. So why just do this stuff? was the thing that I finally kicked me out of uh, academia in, uh, in direction of business. So there were two questions here. Uh, okay, so we all are like reading many, many things about artificial intelligence and then like you watch Black Mirror or Westworld and then like we get crazy because uh, like we don't know many things about it and uh, like it's kind of sometimes unrealistic or sometimes exaggeration so i want you to use a like future outlook maybe what should we be prepared for in the short term or maybe can you you can say just something about like no, the I, projects I, that you're interested sure, in sure. sure no short answer no idea like uh, <laughs> i don't know like what's happening next and uh, you know it's like very funny because you like some of the research is public you know mm, like what big companies are doing more or less, right? Because like Google, Facebook, Amazon, they're like making some of the, these announcements each year, but they're like, they have a bunch of projects which are totally hidden from the public. And like, for, exa for example, there are like presentations about, uh, I don't know if you know Google X, that was like the Moonshot Factory within Google, they do like very crazy projects. So at some point they decided that they want to have like a, a build a ship, like for $200 million. They build like a airship which will fly around and like, that was basically for what it was, um, either for, I guess, for the internet, like uh, something like, you know, for, the, for, for having the Wi-Fi globally or something, stuff like that. Uh, so they thinking about really like crazy stuff uh, all the time, and you never know what will happen next, in that sense. But uh, my, my, like, my perspective is very optimistic in the sense, I don't believe in like sudden changes. It might happen locally, but on, Globally, on the whole, it's like going very smoothly. You know, you will have like better visual recognition. You will have better integration with the machines. So what may come is like we integrate, we get mo much more computation power from our phones, and, or it won't be phones. Uh, we we get like autonomous cars. I, I, I thinking as, as a whole about it, it's like going to the direction of like smoothness and like the smoothness of experience of everything, basically, of communication, of traveling. Like that, because that's like, in, in the end, the society have to accept it. So that's why you, you can't make drastic changes at a time. You have to go smoothly. That's uh, that was last question or like. Um. So uh, I would be interested in your opinion, uh, because like you kind of implied that uh, governments in Europe should increase their funding spending on research and artificial intelligence and I would be interested in um, like the reason for that because I mean when like we've been talking about the incentives for business which is clear I mean there is a profit um, uh, expectation that drives research um, and also we've been talking about like the example about Chinese government that and like I mean the intention could be um, like stipulation of the economy 
um, to have a competitive advantage over other countries' economies, but also, of course, I, I think that kind of also um, uh, what's implied uh, control over the citizens, speaking of, I don't know, this like social scoring systems or whatsoever. Um, so my question was, and I mean, there is like that you also mentioned this, like there are companies that do huge investments. So would like your appeal to say, or, or your um, uh, your point of uh, like demanding for more funding of European governments be this like economic perspective to say like, okay, to be in order to be competitive, European startups whatsoever, like need more funding from governments because private uh, like players cannot do that or is it um, like for governmental applications or is it because in general like for this like science sake argument we need to know more so I would be interested in your perspective on that right yeah uh, so there are two things basically so on the one hand it's really for governmental uh, applications so what we need is like no it's like really government of China which is testing some of the applications with partnership with Alibaba Baidu or Tencent. Uh, so this is what uh, should be also happening here. Like we have very little innovative projects like that happening with like, it's like someone said, it's like very hard to talk with the, uh, with the officials uh, about it, that, that, uh, about innovation and how like it, it changes slowly, but it should like, they should have budget so they would know that they can spend on innovation which could be done with partnerships with private companies. So I'm not like I'm not saying that. So this funding and this larger budgets are not for funding startups. Like you have already a lot of VC money on the market. You have already like funds, EU funds for uh, to also apply for for like grants, so you can get subsidized. Uh, but the thing is that you should also have more funds for the government itself to try different things uh, about building like a smart. Uh, smart city, smart country, like. Could you ask on this? So because like you think there is not, in mud, uh, not enough private funding or no private business case for this, like there would be no incentive for Google, for instance, to go into this direction, or is but it for governments to maintain control of the oh, outcome? Sure, no, but that's, that's the thing. You know, it's, it's Google. So actually Google is American. Yeah. So if, and if you want to be competitive, like with, if Europe is to be competitive, then it should have its own companies like Google to collaborate with countries. So, so that's, the, that's the issue because, okay, I, I mean, if you're fine with uh, US and Google, then it probably be China versus US in artificial intelligence. But if Europe were to count, then we should somehow collaborate with governments. We, uh, governments should collaborate with startups. Because right, Google can do many projects by itself just having an, um, you know, like a stamp of uh, acceptation from the, from the officials. But the thing is that there should be much more projects and budgets, budgets for that to experiment within the public sector with private companies, like, you know, like doing autonomous public transportation or like um, having different VR AR projects within the city, like, or you, using some advanced analytics to fasten the traffic flow. Like th this kind of things which, because th there's like a big uh, big thing here to, to that government has, n namely, namely data, you know, like whether it's Ministry of Finance of like, or Ministry of Health, they all have data or on patients, of like of people, which they can use and, and they know how they can use that, right? So it's all about the data and the usage of data that governments have. Uh, to make lives for the citizens better. And that should be the direction. Then the lack is like there is not enough private investments money on the table in Europe to do projects without governmental support. No, there is enough. Okay. <laughs> there is no there is enough money for like for the private thing, but there should be more money for the pub for the public uh, for the officials to make experiments with uh, with private Right, so, so I, I'm thinking about money on the, pr on the public side. So I'm thinking about research institutes, which are publicly founded. I am thinking about projects which are kind of be between science and business with partnerships with companies uh, to experiment within the city. Because if you want to experiment within the city or within the country, then you need to have, 
acceptations from, from the officials. And, and then th they should be also involved with, within the process in order to make things better for the citizens. <sighs> Thank you. <laughs> Yes, Przemek, again, thank you. This was really, really inspiring. Um, we will have now a break of, let's say, half an hour. We can meet here like uh, quarter past uh, 12. And um, then I will just tell you more about your assignment, uh, about the groups, and then we will have like a um, time for the workshops. You can work on those uh, business ideas, and we will have also lunch break. And at half past two, um, we will have... Um, well, also a workshop on, on design thinking, I think. <laughs> um, yes, so thank you again, and um, yeah, so see you in half an hour, yeah? <laughs>